For the last decade, Futera, the specialist communications company I co-founded, has sought to creatively and effectively engage people on the biggest challenge of our times, sustainability. During this time, we've delivered almost 500 projects, worked on five continents, and our work has touched literally millions of people. What follows are some of the key insights from what we have found really works to deliver behaviour change over the last 10 years. Tomorrow is amazing. The future is beautiful. Cities planted with urban trees and gardens, parks that bloom with food and flowers, streets plied peacefully by electric vehicles, pedestrians and pedal power, where cutting edge technological innovations and natural systems work together, not against each other, and economies are localised and resilient. Where we harness solar rays, driving winds, pounding waves and cascading rivers to generate power for all supported by heat captured from the sun and from temperature differences in the earth beneath our feet. A cleaner, greener, secure and independent energy supply that's not ripped from natural sources like fossil fuels, but rather powered by the abundant natural forces that surround us. You'll still read naughty novels and scream your guts out at football on TV, flirt in bars, gossip with friends and try to cook up the latest Jamie Oliver. Look after your kids, love your kids, be exasperated by your kids. Love, laughter, sex, status and arguments about it all stay in the mix. Good people, bad people, risk and fun are all still happening, but against a background of environmental balance. It's a powerful, positive vision for the future that embraces both people and nature, our ecology and economy, and our cultures and identities in a changing climate. It's rooted in reason, driven by necessity, and above all, triumphantly possible. It's not boring, but it is sustainable. The future is more than possible with the know-how we have today, but it's a long, long way from likely. Around the world, carbon emissions continue to soar, oceans acidify, half the world overeats on a wobbling journey towards obesity whilst the other half starves. Growing and distributing food seems about as secure as an investment in a collateralised debt obligation. Barely 10% of the world's adults control 85% of global wealth, oil production peaks, ancient water supplies begin to dry up and world population tips over 7 billion souls. The list goes on. Yet the single most empowering thought that emerges from this apparently catastrophic, converging and connected set of challenges is this. We are the first generations to know, understand and appreciate the scale and complexity of the problems we collectively face. Knowledge in this sense is real power. We can't fix what we won't acknowledge isn't really working. Overcoming this denial is fundamental to local, national, societal and cultural transformation for sustainability. But denial is a very attractive place to be. It's easier for individuals when confronted with the reality of massive global threats like climate change to either deny their own sense of agency, what difference can little old me possibly make, or deny it's happening at all, thereby letting themselves off the hook of changing behaviour. Acknowledging the scientific evidence and its implications takes a strong stomach, and personally acting on it an even stronger sense of will and determination. Worse, Armageddon messages often create a greater desire for denial. I'm going to take you through what we at Futera consider to be the four critical components of creative communications that inspire behaviour change beyond the usual suspects. The stories, the sizzle, the salience and the social proof. The stories we tell ourselves about how the world works are crucial. Perhaps the most potent cultural narrative of the developed world over the last century has been the idea of progress. Expectations have been that life gets better for each subsequent generation as progress develops in a one-directional, linear fashion. But this idea of the inevitable triumph of progress is potentially fatally flawed. Progress dips and troughs, cycles and backtracks. The numerous challenges mentioned earlier are aligning into a perfect storm of competing circumstances. This increases the possibility of a progress trap in which the pursuit of progress itself is actively creating impacts that themselves then undermine the potential for further and future progress. The pursuit of cheap energy like coal to fuel progress whilst at the same time accelerating climate change through increased carbon emissions is a brutally simple example of this paradox. So we need to change the story we tell ourselves. Paradigm shift is probably one of the most over and misused terms in sustainability. Incidentally, reformulating your soap powder is not a paradigm shift. Incrementally increasing the fuel efficiency of a car by a few miles per gallon is not a paradigm shift. By paradigm shift, we mean a lasting and significant change in the way we see the world, our relationship to it and each other. And such shifts don't happen overnight. The magical, visceral imagery of Earthrise over the moon's surface taken in 1968 is often accredited with helping to birth the modern environmental movement. 
Sustainability pioneer John Elkington writes that paradigm shifts take decades, generations to fully embed. We are but a mere 50 years into this ecological one, with another 20 to 30 years to go before it becomes genuinely transformative. Personally, I find this incredibly exciting, and it inspires me, helps my patience, and provokes me to perpetually push boundaries in a playful way. Indeed, one of my favourite quotes has always been, if you want to subvert the dominant paradigm, you have to have more fun than they are, and let them know while you're doing it. There are literally millions of amazing, awe-inspiring stories of positive change for sustainability out there. From Futera's own global phenomena of clothes swapping swishing parties, to life-changing microfinance initiatives, or renewable energy projects from simple handmade wind turbines to futuristic concentrated solar power, or super sexy electric vehicles to the humble bamboo bicycle. Old school ownership models are changing. Crowdsourced car clubs like Whipcar move us from owning stuff to accessing service with massive dematerialization and resource benefits along the way. Collaborative consumption portals like Airbnb democratize accommodation by allowing us to turn our homes into hotels. Whilst we may grind our teeth in frustration at the overall pace of change, the signs of upbeat practical optimism are diverse and manifold. It is all too easy to lose sight of the rapidity of some changes too. In business strategy planning meetings, I like reminding people that if seven years ago I'd have told you that in 2011 there'd be a business called Facebook with 500 million members worldwide and a market value of $50 billion plus based on social media, your response would have likely been, what's social media? So positive change is not only possible, it's happening and needs promoting. This is also the essence of Futera's publication, Sizzle. Inspired by legendary US salesman Elmer Wheeler, whose marketing diktat when shifting hot dogs was, don't sell the sausage, sell the sizzle. Elmer knew if you weren't selling the enticing, desirable sounds and smells of the cooking sausage, you were quite literally selling a dead pig. Unfortunately, when it comes to selling sustainability and behaviour change, we're still pushing poor deceased porkers, not the sizzle. Our report has been downloaded over 250,000 times, so it clearly resonates, and its formula for communications and engagement is simple. Start with a powerful, positive vision of the low-carbon, sustainable future we're aiming for. Low-carbon heaven, not climate hell. Make it visual, tangible, imaginative but credible, and make it right for your audience. It's the low-carbon vision they want to see, not the one you want. As the famous cartoon from the Copenhagen Summit on Climate Change has it, so many of our smart solutions to climate change are simply common sense. So even if you're a dyed-in-the-wool climate sceptic, your only complaint might be that if the supposed hoax of anthropogenic climate change isn't real, we might fix the world for nothing. Once a compelling vision of the future is established in your audience's mind's eye, then you can follow up with the tough choices of what's at stake, the risks of inaction, lack of urgency, business or lifestyle as usual. Building on these with a realistic outline plan of what might be delivered in the next five years, and specific actions that individuals can personally do, and you have an effective blueprint for communications that can transform. So we change the story, we sell the sizzle. Next comes salience. It's a fancy word for what in this context might also be described as visibility or prominence. People prioritise and engage with attitudes or behaviours that are meaningful to them in one of three main ways. They are relevant to their own direct person experience, they favour the individual's self-interest, or they meet or fulfil an existing aspiration or need. Salience of sustainability values, attitudes and behaviours is therefore critical in driving positive change. Creative communication is a key way of changing the salience of these. This is usually best done through our fourth component, the creation of social proof. Social proof is about the signals we send to and pick up from each other about what is perceived as normal acceptable behaviour. From the weird ritual of tie wearing, well that's a splendid noose around your neck there may I say, to the tendency to join queues as the presence of people waiting in line might suggest something worth queuing for. We are sociable creatures for whom conformity is important. Social proof is also unconscious. We don't sit there consciously pondering our behaviours, well not often enough anyway, it's largely intuitive. There are three elements of social proof that are crucial for behaviour change. Firstly, the personal. Do I have the knowledge, the awareness, the right attitude, sense of agency, motivation and incentives to undertake the new behaviour? Secondly, the social. What is perceived as normal behaviour? How salient and visible is the behaviour change? And what are the people around me doing, my family, friends or work colleagues? Thirdly, and finally, the infrastructural. Are the right equipment, infrastructure, mechanisms or facilities in place to enable the new behaviour? This can all sound a bit abstract until we see how these different aspects come together to drive behaviour change in the real world. So let's take the story, the sizzle, the salience and social proof 
in the form of personal, social and infrastructural triggers and look at their role in the take-up of youth community volunteering through one of Futera's clients, Rock Corps. Rock Corps is a US-based international organisation that uses the direct incentivization of free concert tickets to drive youth volunteering in local communities. Founded by seven friends, their original aim was to make community volunteering a normal part of young people's lives. For example, by doing four hours volunteering in a local old people's home, you might get a ticket to see Lady Gaga. You give and get given. The typical story of young people these days is often tainted. Young people are dismissed as valueless, troubled, problematic, undisciplined, lacking respect or lazy. Rock Corps aims to challenge and change that narrative by focusing on empowering and engaging young people through the things they care about. In this case, music. Uh, the reason that we're all here tonight is because you volunteer. Uh, that is the beauty of Rock Corps. You give and then you get given. Their vision is moving a generation to change the world. And they sizzle that vision through the amazing concerts of big name artists from Primal Scream to Professor Green they throw for their volunteers. Orange Rock Corps, thank you. I need to know, are you ready to get Grammy right about now? Crucially, Rock Corps have an intuitive understanding of their audience's psychology, what they think, care about and do. And they know that an earned reward, volunteers must do a minimum of four hours community work, has a much stronger influence and lasting effect on the individuals involved than simply a gift of a free ticket. They also know that the desire to do the right thing is also doomed without the ticket. Plus, music is high status, volunteering unfortunately isn't. By using the draw of music, Rock Corps elevates the status of volunteering to something cool and aspirational. Because young people volunteer in large numbers, there is a massive boost for the salience and status of volunteering generally, and reinforcement of the social proof that it's a cool, normal, rewarding and worthwhile thing to do. Plus, in the context of symbolic self-completion, the desire to behave in a way that labels we apply to ourselves might suggest, even the simple act of being defined as the type of person who volunteers is enough to increase the likelihood of that individual undertaking further volunteering in the future i.e. self-identifying as the type of person who volunteers. This is an enormously powerful programme that in the UK alone has engaged over 40,000 often hard to reach young people in the last three years, delivering 160,000 hours of community service and changing participants' relationships with themselves, each other, their local environment and community and wider society and world as a whole. It's not rocket science, it's just respecting who their audience of young people are. Messy, wonderful, occasionally selfish, sex-obsessed and mucky little human beings and working creatively alongside that to deliver potentially transformative change. As communicators, we often undervalue our role in driving change or worry that our efforts will always be inconsequential in the face of larger forces and vested interests. But the vision of tomorrow that I began this talk with is perfectly possible and bold, creative communications will be absolutely critical in delivering it. So it's down to us. No pressure. We are the people we've been waiting for. So here's what we do. Firstly, we tell the stories. We have the best ones after all. We capture the hearts and minds of everyone, starting from where they are, and we demonstrate not just the necessity and urgency of change, but its desirability. Secondly, we sell the sizzle. We get people excited about a positive vision of a low carbon heaven that's relevant to them. We explain the choice of what's at stake and we start now with a plan for where we're heading, how to get there and what they as individuals and we can collectively do along the way. Thirdly, we create salience. We make behaviour changes visible, prominent and meaningful for people. Fourthly and finally, we generate social proof. Putting the infrastructure in place, establishing new behavioural norms and informing, inspiring and incentivising individuals. And finally, let's smile. Let's have more fun than they are and let them know while we're doing it. You never know, we might just change the world. Tomorrow is amazing. The future is beautiful. Let's go tell everyone.